All right, welcome to video number two. This is rain gardens um, and watershed best management practices, also known as low impact development. So you'll see the words low impact development, LID, and you'll see the word BMPs, best management practices, all used together. Um, we're gonna go through rain gardens quite extensively, and then I'll um, talk a little bit more about some of the other BMPs or LIDs. Um, again, they're, they're used um, interchangeably often for stormwater. The difference being LID is usually exclusively um, low impact development, usually for stormwater. BMP, again, are best management practices and can be um, used in other things that don't have anything to do with stormwater. So it can be a best management practice for agriculture, for example. Um, so we're going to concentrate first on, on rain gardens. So when we were talking, when we're talking about rain gardens, um, usually you have some sort of um, poor soil. Um, this is actually, it says a rain garden, but often if there's a drainage pipe, then it's considered a bioswale. So this is a bit confusing, but again, bioswales and rain gardens, rain gardens typically don't have this drainage pipe. Once you put in this optional drainage pipe, we traditionally then call it a bioswale. So it's a bit confusing, but we'll go through it. But again, you have water and um, drought tolerant native plants here. You're storing water, you often have mulch, and again, it's in a place where it will receive water and let it um, drain down through the porous soil. So rain gardens are appealing landscape shallow depressions planted with perennial plants, so plants that come back every year, um, that capture and filter stormwater from impervious surfaces such as rooftop driveways and parking lots. They reduce flooding by absorbing this rainwater from the impervious surfaces and filter oil, grease, and toxic material before they reach and pollute streams. Um, they also reach out to the groundwater by allowing, when rainwater comes, by allowing slowly to recharge into the soil rather than quickly going from impervious surface straight to the stream. Um, and also provides beneficial wildlife habitats such as bird and butterfly habitat. So these are some pictures of some residential rain gardens. Um, so here you can see this is kind of a, um, before and after picture and here you can see here's the site before and you can see where they had the downspout here the downspouts are here and now they're being directed towards um, this beautiful rain garden um, here's another before and after so again here's their site here before it goes into the um, the street and a down sloping area and here's where they put their rain garden on their property um, so actually, Maryland um, was the, one of the first to use rain gardens. Um, so it was used in the, in the early 1990s to reduce non-point source pollution to the Chesapeake Bay. And based on designs for bioretention basins that are often used at these large construction sites where they have this big depressed area and they add some soil, the idea was it was that, but let's make it more beneficial and let's add native plants and make it something that can be long-term. Um, Often the downspouts go directly to the street. So here you have a downspout coming off of a house for the roof. So that entire roof area on that side of the house is gonna go through the downspout. So all the rain that goes on that roof is gonna come into this one point. Um, and then often that one point um, then goes um, into the, um, they were directed usually towards the streets. From the streets, they're directed into gutters and again, these gutters often go straight to um, the water, so straight to um, water bodies. So again, stormwater flow can be fast, which causes erosion in the stream and carries sediment and associated nutrients from lawn, sidewalk, and streets into the stream waterways. In addition to sediment, stormwater can also carry fertilizers, pesticides, petrochemicals, pet waste, heavy metals, grass clippings, leaves, yard waste, and trash from the roof lawns and driveways. Um, as they carry them to the um, gutters, um, to the street gutters. So in a rain garden, how it removes nutrients is basically um, the nutrients can absorb. So some of these petrochemicals and nutrients can absorb to the soil particles. Um, they can also be removed through plant uptake. Um, so mainly this would be phosphorus and metals and again, uptake of nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, microbial processes can break down some of these organics. So some of the petrochemicals and pathogens can be broken down through microbial process. Again, exposure to sunlight 
um, and dryness can also um, kill pathogens. So again, we have pet waste that has a lot of E. coli. When that runs into the waterways, it actually increases the E. coli count, but if it runs into a, a rain garden, the UV penetration followed by dry wet cycles can help um, kill those pathogens. Um, again, minor abatement of localized flooding. Um, and so the idea is that we can increase the base flow to the groundwater in that area, and again, use the soil to remove nutrients like we would in the leach field. Um, and then finally, total suspended solids, floating debris, trash, other things, again, as they come into that um, rain garden, they're gonna settle out slowly in that rain garden and stay deposited there. So if you think here you have a parking lot, a sheet flow of parking lot, um, into here would be kind of the rain garden here. So you might have a grass filter strip first, and then from that, it may go into the actual rain garden. Um, with again, you have a berm on the outside to keep the water in, so it kind of keeps it up. And then again, if this is a bioswale, um, then you would have a outlet. So that would be optional, depending on if you have a rain garden or bioswale. Um, so the design steps, um, the first thing you're gonna do is assess how water flows across the property. So the site should be upslope of where it collects. So you don't want it in the absolute bottom area, but you do want it downslope of all of the downspouts, driveways, sump pump outlets, any of those water um, ways that are gonna come in and you wanna kind of catch it as it's going towards the very bottom area. Um, you want it three feet from a sidewalk, six to 10 feet from the basement or a house foundation, 10 feet from a tanning wall, 25 feet from septic tank leach fields. You don't wanna put it in really poorly drained soils. You do want this to drain through and recharge the groundwater. You do wanna put it away from utility lines and if possible, put it in full sun so that your plants will thrive and increase the nutrient removal through uptake. Your slope of the rain garden itself is gonna be anywhere from one to 10%. So it might have a very small slope. You don't want it to be too sloping so the water just runs the top of it. You want it to actually stay in there and collect that water. Um, again, you need to assess the soil infiltration and texture, how much clay you have. Because again, a clay is going to act like a liner, which is great in a wetland if you're treating wastewater and you don't you want it to stay in the wetland. But if you're trying to infiltrate, your clay content is going to actually not allow that infiltration to take place. So you want to assess um, the soils with drainage of less than one half inch per hour are not going to be appropriate for rain gardens without um, bringing in other kinds of substrate to allow that um, infiltration to occur. So not brining at the bottom. Um, so when we do an infiltration test, we basically dig a hole six inches by six inches deep. We fill it with water. We mark the level with just a yardstick. Um, you check your watch and record the time. So you want to measure the drop. So every hour, so for example, one hour every 15 minutes, you're going to measure how much the inches drop and that's your infiltration test. Um, so interpreting this, so if it's less than one half inch per hour, you don't want to do it without professional assistance. Um, because again, you need to bring in all new soil and excavate and then bring in a drainage layer. Um, if it's between one half inch and one inch per hour, it's pretty low for a rain garden. So you might want to build it larger and deeper or plan for additional flow during high water events because it's not going to infiltrate that fast. Um, between one and one and a half inches per hour is pretty adequate, um, but you might have overflow during a very high rain event. Um, again, one and a half to two inches is, is great. Um, and then if it's faster than two inches an hour, that's pretty high. So you might want to have um, a drought tolerant plants because it's going to move through there very quickly. And it also is not gonna hold as much water. So you might have denser planting um, to try to keep that water in place. So the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna determine the size of the, grand, of the um, rain water, or the rain garden, excuse me. So at least 10% of the impervious surface should drain to the, end, to the rain garden. So the length of the width of the impervious surface that you have times about 10% is the area of the rain water, the rain garden that you're gonna design. Um, ideally, they should be between six and 24 inches deep with um, two to four inches of additional for depth for safety. Um, you wanna add about three inches of mulch to your final garden um, that is about 12 inches deep. Um, so then you must excavate to 15 inches if you're going to do that three inches of mulch and then you want that 12 foot depth from grade. And again, they should be about five feet wide to accommodate gentle slopes or more than five feet wide. 
Um, so again, so the ponding depth, again, if it's, if it's not very fast, then you want a larger ponding depth up to two feet. If it's pretty fast, then you can have a shallow ponding depth in terms of how far you dig down when you build your rain garden. Um, to get the water to the rain garden, you're gonna dig trenches, um, gutter extenders, or build artificial streams so that it'll go to that, but also design for overflow. So you might wanna paint a notch or again, a, a drain pipe in the berm um, or a French drain or something that can um, allow for overflow. Um, you do need to get permits. You want to choose the right plants for the right place as well as the soil amendments. Um, and then you need to think about maintenance, water, and upkeep of your drainage. So if you are doing a drainage pipe, um, again, Darcy's laws apply to a rain garden cross section. So the specific discharge is the hydraulic conductivity, how fast the water moves, multiplied the ratio of the water height divided by the layer thick thickness of the soil or substrate that you have in there. Um, so if you're thinking about a rain garden with a cross section here, here we have um, so many feet of substrates, a sandy loom and, and a, on a top layer. Um, again, you're adding nine inches for um, a, a ponding level. And then you might then have this outlet here um, that then, so if it's a bioswale, so then that allows for overflow drainage after it goes through everything. So that outlet is gonna be at a low level. Um, so that it goes through everything and then at the end we have outlets so that we can keep the water moving. But again, all the treatment is taking place as it's moving through. So again, a summary, um, infiltration rate you want greater than an inch per hour. Um, the depth's going to range for 6 to 12 inches, about 9 inches is standard. Um, typically, 3 to 8 percent of the watershed, depending on impervious surface. So again, up to 10 percent is a good, is a good um, area of the impervious surface. Um, flat areas that are downstream of impervious surface work best. And then again, you want a shallow bowl naturally serving as that rain garden, if it's available. Um, seasonal high water table shouldn't come within two feet of surface. So you don't want to do this where you're actually going to get this ground, um, groundwater infiltrating into the bottom of the rain garden. Um, areas that flood readily for at least two weeks would not be great for doing it because again, you're not going to get a lot of infiltration if it's already a flooded area. So that's why you might want to build up a little bit upstream of that flooded area. Um, and again, you need some mulch, a minimum of two inches is needed, three to four inches of mulch is preferable. Um, but you don't want something that's going to float. <laughs> so mulch should be hardwood, not um, bark nuggets which float. Um, so to prepare the site, it should be flat and level so the water entering the garden is evenly distributed. And so you're going to, um, when you excavate that soil, you're going to put it around to kind of form the berm around the rain garden. So keep the soil you excavate. So here is an example. So here's the, the soil that they excavated that they're gonna keep for their berm. Um, so again, water's gonna flow into the, um, the groundwater naturally. And so the berm keeps it in here. Um, so it should be shaped so that it's solid and then you should plant on the berm so that it's protected from the erosion. Um, so here's them kind of creating this berm around you can install a rock swell. So if here's your um, pipe coming in, you can again have this rock swell to help um, just bring the um, the water or bring the rainwater of the stormwater to your rain garden. Again, you can use some of the soil, but you'll have to like kind of amend it a little bit. So a good soil amendment might be some sand, organic matter, topsoil. So again, that it's nice and porous and you mix it well. Um, you want plants that are hardy. Um, if possible, um, consider height, color. Native plants tend to be more tolerant to the wet and dry conditions and, and might grow deeper roots and have more disease, um, disease resistance. They also attract birds and butterflies. And you could use plants that bloom at different times of the season to create a longer flowering season. So here's kind of a completed, um, here's your rock swell. You have kind of this berm around it that's been replanted. And then you have um, your mulch here. Um, for the first year or so, um, maintenance will include weeding and watering to help, them be, help the plants become established. Long-term maintenance is going to be anything else. You should be adding mulch and compost. Um, the berm will have to be checked and stabilized. And then again, adding that compost will help keep the microbes happy. The rooftop drainage area. Um, so this is an example. So if you have a rooftop drainage area that's 25 feet by 42 feet, then that's uh, um, about a thousand square foot rooftop. 
So then if you have a rain garden, let's say 20%, 10% is really what you want to do a minimum. Let's say you want to build it a little bit bigger because you have a less um, drainage um, rate. Um, so you would have about a 12 foot by 19 foot rain garden. Um, oh, it's supposed to be 105. Sorry. Was, um, so the rain garden would be, oh, sorry, this is the rooftop drainage area is 1,000. So the rain garden is going to be about 200. That's right. So um, the rain garden at about 200 feet squared would have about eight inches in depth and about five cubic yards of sand or soil that you would bring in, some creek rock, and again, some mulch. Um, so this, again, for your example of your 12 foot by 16 foot rain garden, you would have plants, again, cheaper if you can transplant or buy wholesale. You would um, have the, the rocks and the, and the um, mulch and the sand mix brought in. Um, again, labor, <laughs> if you're doing this for a business, then obviously you're going to charge for labor. If this is something that you're doing in your own house, then hopefully you can dig it yourself. Um, so again, $500 if you have zero labor, but obviously labor is going to factor in there if this is something that you're hiring somebody to do or you are um, doing it as a business model. Um, additional details to think about. Um, you don't want to place it where it might cause problems for your neighbor. So you don't want to place it so the overflow goes right into their yard. Um, you don't want to place it where it might, again, when your plants grow, that it might block, block intersections. Um, again, you perfectly put water in this area, so you don't want to neglect your rain garden or else it can just be a muddy mess. And again, watch for buried water lines, septic systems, and electric cables. And again, call before you dig um, for any utilities. So this would be an example of a nice mature rain garden. You can see the rock swell coming into it, and then it goes all the way along this area here. Um, again, the bioswells, they're similar to rain gardens, but then they're gonna have this outlet here. So again, the outlet is at the bottom of the gravel base. It's a perforated pipe, so it has holes in the top of it, so it goes into the pipe, and then it's solid on the bottom part, and so it lets that um, water come out. But it's, it's, it's developed very similar to a rain garden up until this point, but usually this is all brought in because you have to dig low enough to get your pipe in and then you bring all your soil in. Um, but it has an outlet. Um, and often these are adjacent to parking lots. Um, again, so because there's so much runoff, especially it's a very large parking lot, you usually need that outlet. Again, um, this is just showing the same thing. You have an inflow and you have an outflow. You have your mix, your stone layer, and your mulch layer so that it can um, go through. And again, you're gonna do an infiltration test and make sure that those mixes are correct to get the right infiltration rate. Um, so again, the benefits, nutrient reduction, stormwater management, water retention, and again, your maintenance is gonna vary on location, but here's kind of your typical um, parking lot bioswale. Um, dry wells, um, dry wells are similar, but without kind of the ecology you can think of it. Um, so basically with a dry well, um, what it is, is it's underlying a tension sensor that basically retains it, but then it will allow it to infiltrate back into the soil. So you're just gonna, it's kind of more like a leach field. So you don't have above ground plants. You're just gonna be focusing on um, storing and infiltration. So basically, it's usually used for stormwater, like residential buildings where you don't have a large area, but you need to capture all the water coming from that roof area. And so um, you still want to have it away from the foundation, just like you would for a rain garden. The difference being is that it's basically going to have this, this um, sump that's basically in the ground, and then basically that spills over and infiltrates. So you have basically holes that are put into this, this big um, barrel and then water flows through that holes into the underrounding area. Um, Filterra systems. Um, what a Filterra system is, this is actually in a, a kind of a trademarked, um, you know, low impact development. And basically it's captured by this mulch um, and it continues through this filter media. So the Filterra is the filtered media. And basically, it immobilizes pollutants, patent protected filter media that they put in that mobilizes the pollutants. And so then it percolates through the underdrain and is discharged. So it's very much similar to a bioswell. The difference being here is we're putting in this um, bi media to help remove um, pollutants that's been patented with special. Um, the media basically has um, higher absorption sites, so it can absorb some um, of the pollutants. Um, you can have a grass well. So grass wells are just U-shaped channels that are lined with grasses. 
Um, they're usually installed next to roads. And so again, the idea is that the it's going to flow into this grass well and then infiltrate to the bottom. Again, that U shape allows it to actually pond up. So it can pond all the way up to here, but then slowly infiltrate into um, the ground. Again, compared to other BMPs, this is super easy to maintain, pretty cheap, and also serves the purpose of, of holding rainwater and then storing it and letting it infiltrate. Um, so again, here's your kind of basic grass well. So you might have two to 10 inches here, and then you want a three to one slope as you go up on your cell. Um, and so again, the minimum leap is gonna be about 50 feet. You have to give it a long area, so it's almost like a, a large basin, um, just so that you can hold enough stormwater. Um, again, your in value, we'll talk about this more when we get to stream restoration, but it's kind of the roughness. So you do need to make sure your grass is still growing and you have this roughness to kind of slow the water down as it comes through. Um, again, you need about 95% vegetation density, so these have to be kept grassed, is the idea. Um, the grass height is want to be kept high. You don't want to mow this really low. You want at least three to six inches of grass, um, and then you want your slope to be two to ten inches. Again, um, if for 50% total solids removal, anywhere from 50 to 200 feet. Um, and again, the slow characteristics, your maximum is going to be two inch two inches infiltration rate. Um, you want it to be somewhere between one and two. Um, so again, it should be, um, check dams can be used to kind of slow the water down as it goes through the grass well to make sure it doesn't pass it too quickly, um, depending on the slope that you have. Um, infiltration trenches, um, these are again gonna just be the rock infiltration part. So basically you might have some, some planted gardens here these are just planters and then it goes into an infiltration trench here so it can have some characteristics of a rain garden but basically the infiltration trench is going to then have rocks that's going to slowly infiltrate that water either directly into the surrounding sediment here or it might have an outlet pipe but usually it's, it's been infiltrated into the surrounding through the rock into the surrounding sediments down below um, permeable pavements and permeable um, pavers so basically the surface layer is a porous material, either asphalt or concrete, or it's constructed with gaps that allow basically the water to move through. Um, it does have a sub base. So we're gonna talk about green, green roofs where you basically have water catchment areas. So they do have that water catchment area that actually, so there is a, you actually have to dig down deeper, do the sub base where it's actually a catchment that actually brings the water underneath then the layer of porous asphalt that's done below. And again, the primary function is to manage peak runoff, um, but can again also reduce standing water and recharge groundwater. And then finally, just tree planting, plants and trees. Um, so the idea is you have evaporation, transpiration, intercept, again, the canopy is going to slow stormwater coming down, um, and then it recharge the groundwater through roots. So that's the lecture that I had for today. There's some really fun videos, and I do take, I do, um, Think that you should take time to watch those. The, for, the one we're not going to watch today but it's installing rain gardens is kind of a five minute video that just goes through that process. Um, it's a pretty nice one. There's also about a 10 minute video of this old house. I don't know if anyone remembers that PBS show and um, they go through a residential rain garden which is really interesting as well. I'll show you the online management tool and here's another about five minute extension rain garden video that's pretty good but I am going to show you a, just a funny extension video on low impact development because I think it's cute. Um, but first I will show you this urban design tool. So this is the design tool that they have. I have the link in there and it tells you about different techniques, some design examples, um, some, you know, it's, a, it's actually a really nice, you can start a design on what you want to do. And so this is something that I do um, recommend. You can select your design and I do recommend that you go through this site and kind of play with it and we can talk about it um, during the class time. But I do want to show this fun video just because it's fun. So, um, and then that'll be the end of the lecture when the video ends. If it'll load, we'll see. If not, then I'll just ask you to watch the video on your own if I can get it to load here.
try this. Oh, okay, I'm not gonna get it to load. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video here. You do have the content and hopefully you'll be able to watch this video because it's super cute. And so um, if we, I'll, I'll make sure that you get uh, a link that works for watching the video because unfortunately it looks like I'm not able to watch it right now. Um, Yeah, it looks like I have to download something, which is too bad. I was hoping to just watch it from here. So um, anyway, it's a cute video. Hopefully we can get it um, working. But um, thank you for listening to my second online lecture and I'll hopefully um, be able to discuss this with this lecture with you on, um, Thursday, on Thursday. So thank you so much.